Praise God. What a joy, my friends, it is both to be with you, to speak God's word to you, to sing with you, and have one thing in common, and that is the blessed blood of the Lamb. I'm going to read to you from Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. I'm going to read to you the first five verses. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all Galileans or other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What a familiar text that is, no doubt, to each and every one of us who are gathered here tonight. Friends, what tragedies there has been in history. And very much the days in which we live, like the accounts here in, in Luke 13, some tragedies were, if you like, from the evil of men, or we could call them just by nature. I would be confident to suggest that there wouldn't be anyone in this room tonight who cannot think of some sort of tragedy. A tragedy that's occurred in, in your lifetime. I suspect, though much of the children may have gone home, that even, even some of the younger children or, or younger adults here tonight, those of you who are amongst us, maybe even you can cast your mind back to some kind of tragedy. Whatever you've made of these two years, the ins and outs of that C word, if I dare mention it, in one way, shape or form, it has brought about calamity. What we can be comforted of, saints, is this. Our young children, who are here today, sitting maybe on their, their mother's laps, playing with their toys, maybe by now at home in their beds, need the care of their parents, will in the future witness and hear of tragedies and calamities. Let us think for a moment of some that have taken place in our history. We've just heard a real event from our brother Billy. A, cal a calamity. We could no doubt spend all night listing them and maybe, maybe you'll come to me at the end and said you should have said that one. Well, here goes. The Great Fire of London, 1666. Already mentioned tonight, the sinking of the Titanic. The Great Depression, 1929 to 1933. Both world wars. First one, of course, in 1914, and then again, not many years after, in 1939. And again, we, we could spend our time, couldn't we, listing war after war, tragedy after tragedy, calamity after calamity. And then there was that event that happened, and it was remembered 20 years ago, or remembered for a 20-year anniversary, only last September, known to many of us, as 9-11. I want to confess that it was watching some of the recent documentaries on that tragedy that happened on that awful day. 
that brought me again to this passage and very much this sermon. Like others I've mentioned, this great tragedy inflicted turmoil on many lives. The lives of a nation, possibly, arguably, the whole world. On September the 11th, 2001, most of us who are old enough and looking around, most of you certainly are, will remember where we were and what we were doing when that great tragedy came to our TV screens. The tragic event shook the world. I would say that maybe the world has not been the same since. And I again say confidently that even today we see and experience the effects from it. On that day, 2,996 people lost their lives. That means, friends, that in the blink of an eye, 2,996 families had a loved one taken from them. Mums, dads, brothers, sons, daughters had gone in a moment. On that day, over 25,000 injuries were reported, varying from minor to major. And that doesn't include the great turmoil and the mental and emotional damage that left on multitudes and multitudes of people. Maybe, as I'm saying these things, we're thinking of other tragedies, earthquakes, tsunamis. You remember December 2004, 230,000 people died. Forest fires, diseases, great calamities. Maybe we've cast our minds to other great tragic stories. Hillsborough disaster. We think of the, the F1 or former F1 dri driver, Michael Schumacher, tragically skiing, hit his head and never would be the same. Pop stars, famous people, dying tragically and very young. And of course, in this very city, only five years ago, a man motivated by an evil religion decided to detonate a bomb in the Manchester arena, killing 22 people and causing injury to many more. Of course, then, we go to those tragedies in our own lives, those tragedies that are much closer to home, maybe. The death in a family, that loss of a child, that accident, that diagnosis. Again, I stand here confident on how this does affect each and every one of us. But the question I put to you tonight, what is our response to all of this? What is our response to all of this? Well, I think I can speak again, if you would allow me, for us all in saying we at times sigh and we groan and, th and we think life at times just doesn't seem fair. How terrible it is to hear and to even experience such loss. And sometimes such loss in such brutality. Events that shatter lives. Our response is that which is natural, isn't it? and I hope that it would be, that we offer our condolences, and in many ways we mourn and grieve and offer up our sympathy with affection. As fellow human beings, but friends, certainly as Christians, we ought to seek aid and help, motivated by our godly compassion. When we hear of such tragedies, as already said, we mourn. We remember those affected. Even as churches, we, we often seek to be pragmatic in our response and do all we can to be of good in that current situation. 
And no doubt as churches, we set aside time, don't we? Pleading with God to bring comfort to the afflicted. We pray that in God and in His judgments, that we would be pleased, or that He would be pleased to show His love and kindness and His mercy. I would say to you tonight, that would be a normal response to such tragedies. But friends, if I were to stay there, if I was to step down from this pulpit tonight and end my sermon, I ought to be called to account. Indeed, I would say you ought not have me back. For if we look at the text which I've read, we are considering, look at it with care, look at it with honesty, look at it with clarity, look at it as we would look in a mirror, we must seriously consider some things. And saints, I want to consider with you tonight three things. The information that was put to Jesus, I want to consider the reply that Jesus gave And I want us to consider, and this I want you to, even while I'm speaking, have have those thoughts flashing through your mind. Friends, what does this mean for us as for individuals, but what does this mean for our churches? What does this mean for you? What does this mean for the church that you belong to? But before we even touch those things, let us just consider for one moment that these two events that took place here in this reading. And in reality, those of you who are studious might do a better job, but in reality, friends, there's very little about this portion of Scripture. Most commentators even conclude that there is no further historical account to these two stories. The good old faithful William Hendrickson comments. Here goes. It is impossible to be more specific. Neither Josephus nor any other writer, sacred or secular, relates to this incident. All we really know is what Luke tells us here. That while some people who lived in Galilee and made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, were busily engaged in offering their sacrifices in the temple, they were suddenly cut down upon the orders of Pilate. Consequently, in some sense, the blood of these Galileans were mingled with their sacrifices. Then Hendrickson adds that Pilate was cruel, we know. Again, regarding... The second incident, the Tower of Siloam falling. Little information is given. What we can be sure of is that the tower would have been near the Pool of Siloam, inside possibly the south part of the temple, or the Jerusalem Wall. This fell and killed 18 people. That's all we have. That's all we have. So why then pick this text on this Friday night, in this place, at this time, standing in front of people like you? Why do that? Well, we we conclude regarding the detail of this history, in many ways, such events, it doesn't make too much difference to us. But friends, I want to hear, I want to be, I want to stand here tonight and I ask God that he would imprint upon us something from this text. I believe within it there is great value. So this, this information then that, that's put to Jesus, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Again, I I seek not to give too many comments, but one thing I want to mention to you is this. Note, and you'll have to do this in your own time, by the way, but note the seeming change of subject 
by some of the crowd. Christ, in chapter 12, had just given some hard things to hear. Warnings of being hypocrites, telling them that they cannot discern the weather and they cannot, dis- and they cannot discern. They can discern the weather, forgive me. Yet they cannot discern that God is present. They couldn't see that the Messiah had come. They can look at the sky, they can see it's red at night, that they can discern what's going to take place in the morning. They know what's good for their crops. They can discern all of that. But before them is this Christ. They have it in their Torah. They know what the Scriptures say. And here, the Christ is stood before them and they cannot discern it. The Messiah had come and they missed it. They missed it. Chapter 12 finishes with an emphasis on judgment. And the need for sinners to be reconciled to God now. And if you don't do it before judgment day, you will not be let out. Then we head, don't we, into into chapter 12. 13, some then go to Jesus, tell him of these events, seemingly changing the subject and turning all this around to the blood that was mingled. I do suggest to you that these people were indeed missing the warnings that Christ had already put before them and shifting the emphasis from themselves. And I think that's clear when we look at how Jesus responds. We're in a conversation somewhere, I don't even, even it was with today, Angus and myself and Tim, in fact, I was listening to these men, I made no contribution. How Jesus so wisely dealt himself in these situations. Words of profound wisdom. You see, because something greater than Solomon had come. And here we see a demonstration of the Christ himself. He said this, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? He goes on, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. All those 18 on whom the tower fell in Siloam, And killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all of the men who dealt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here, don't we? We see Jesus getting to the very root of the issue. We see him penetrate in the hearts of men. We see Christ in action. Do you suppose that these were worse sinners than all Galileans because they suffered such things? See, Jesus really does, doesn't he? He puts them against the wall in one sense. He he puts them to the test. Worse These sinners worse than you. Are these sinners worse than you? That's what Jesus is saying. I think it's important to note that these Jews had a philosophy that personal disaster is the result of personal sin. We see that in John 9. Maybe we see that in in the friends of Job. Jesus here refutes that notion and he refutes it twice. Yet what Christ does, doesn't he, is doubly affirm the need to repent. That's what he does. He doubly affirms the need to repent. I tell you, he says, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. 
What is Jesus saying here? What is, is Jesus saying that unless you repent, you too will have a tower fall on you? If, if you don't repent, it will be the next bridge that, takes, that, that breaks as you cross it. If you don't repent, it will be you who is found to be in a, in a, in a tower falling on you. Is, is that what Jesus is emphasizing here? Friends, as I gaze my eyes across this room, I am confident and I hope enough to know that you know enough to know that this is not what Christ is talking about. What is Jesus saying? Let's be clear. And let me add this to you. Jesus is not avoiding the reality of the tragedy that had took place. If we are Bible readers, we will know that Christ was compassionate to men. He was gentle. He had compassion on the poor, the weak, and the afflicted. But friends, what Christ is saying is that all are sinners. And unless you repent, you too will perish. What Christ is doing here is saying, what about you? What about you? What if this happened to you? What if the Tower of Siloam had fell on you? J.C. Ryle says this, have you ever noticed we as men are happy to talk about the death of others, yet avoid the talk of our own? Friends, that ought to stop us. We can, we can chatter all day about that tragedy. We can chatter all day about somebody else's passing from this life into the next. But how often do we consider our own eternal state. It's a question, friends, that we must meditate upon. Whether we are in our late 80s here tonight or whether we are in our teens, tragedies and calamities take place. And we ought to be people who not shrink from such things. Christ does here doesn't he, what the prophets did before him. And praise God what the apostles did after him. And friends, let me say this, what the church ought to be doing today. What is that? He's calling men and women to repentance. He's calling men and women to repent and believe He is saying to the people, have you repented? Have you believed in the one who has come? Are you, are you ready to face death? The state of your soul should be your first concern. The tower asylums fell. They've gone. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And friends, I, I repeat tonight with no apology. These people here had missed the boat. They'd missed it. And Christ is saying, if you do not repent, your soul shall perish for all eternity. This is weighty matters, friends. This is, this is of most seriousness. When judgment finally comes, friends, because judgment does await those who have not repented and believed. There's no escape. There's no back door. There's no fire exit. There's no court of appeal. When judgment comes, it is final. 
It's final, friends. It's final. And there are souls tonight that are perishing. I say it not because this is some great theological moment for this conference. It is not. I'll leave that to the experts. But friends, we must have a, we must go home, whether you serve a church or whether you're part of a church, and ask ourselves questions. And the question I do want to ask you is this. What does this all mean for you? What does this mean for our churches? I don't know if you've noticed, I'm pretty sure that you would have, the last two years, the message has been save lives. Save the NHS. Maybe, I want to be careful here, that maybe underneath all this message, there's some genuine care for the lives of our nation. Maybe. I'll let you guys debate that out. I titled this A Greater Calamity. Because, friends, there is a great need. There's a greater need than saving lives. There's a greater need than preserving lives. And that, dear ones, is the need to repent. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed for men to die once. Maybe even some of you tonight think you may escape that. But friends, it's a pointer for you. I had a text a few days ago. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. And who text messages nowadays? It was a dentist. They'd cancelled my appointment. My wife was due to take the children tonight to uh, have their eyes tested. She got a better option. She cancelled the appointment. But I want to say to you, you will not cancel that day to which you meet with God. You will not. You will not. It is appointed once for man to die. And then the scripture doesn't leave us hanging. It goes further and it says, and after this, after this, after this comes judgment. You know this scripture. Maybe half of you have preached on this, talked on this, quoted this, used it for one of our evangelistic tracks. But friends, what we need tonight is a sense of this. What we need tonight is a reality check. And I do ask you, do we realize, do I, do I realize the weight and the reality of all this? Breath, one day, will cease. Your breath. Brethren, death awaits you. And after that comes judgment. This is no fallacy. This is no Hollywood movie. We speak about the promises of God, don't we? I want to tell you, this is one of them. Death awaits you. You will one day stand before the God of heaven and earth. You will stand before him. What then does that mean for you tonight? I want to ask you, as I'm not here to make any presumptions, I would be weak if I were. Have you yet come to the knowledge, have you, that you are a sinner before a holy God? It was important what Angus said or whoever prayed was Brother Jonathan. We can look at something like Billy and say, oh, wow. But we do. We do. Let's be honest, we do. And in many ways, rightly. 
We can sometimes say, I wish my testimony was like that. Oh, friends, utter nonsense. You are as guilty, as charged before a holy God as any man. For we are filthy before him. He is holy. He is high. He is exalted. He is Christ, the Son of God. And I'm going to ask you, do you know that? Have you, have you come to the knowledge that you have offended a holy God? Or do we make light of sin? You know, one of the problems of any con- most contemporary churches is today is that we make light of sin. Do you know what sin did? Do you know what sin does? Have a good read of Romans chapter 1. Have a look at the, the putridity of it. Have a look at the filth of what it does, what it has done in our lives. You know what it did? You know what it did? It caused the Son of God to come down and be treated and regarded as a criminal. We heard it quoted, He who knew no sin bore the sin of many. This is God, friends, in the flesh who took on sin who knew no sin. Grab hold of it just for a moment. Just for a moment. Have you believed on Christ? Have you? Have you really believed on Christ? There's young ones here tonight. I'm asking you as well. Have you believed upon Him? Have you believed upon the Lamb of God? Who John the Baptist said, there he is, look. Imagine that day. But there he is. The Lamb of God. Who, did, who came to do what? To make your life better? Oh, friends. No. To take away the sin of the world. That's what he did. To take away that putrid That dirty, that filth, that's what he did. He who knew no sin bore the sins of many, whether it's Brother Billy or any of you. It was laid upon him, friends. It was on him, him, Christ. That's where it was. And I'm asking you, humbly, have you yet believed upon him? Have you been washed In the blood of the Lamb. One of my favorite things to speak of and on is the substitutionary atonement. But He took our place. He took our place, didn't He? It's wonderful news. It's wonderful news. What have you done with this gospel? Is it still yet despised? Is it still yet something I might believe upon? Friends, do not tarry, for it's appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. I'm asking you, is it is it is it life to you or is it death to you? Have you turned from your sin not to a religion? Oh, friends, religion will not save you. But have you turned from your sin and looked to the only one that can, and that is Jesus Christ? Have you looked to Him for your salvation? Or are you one of those who are still trusting in your own works? Are you still trusting in your church attendance, in your tithing, in your long-standing membership. All that you would cease from thinking such things. Because that is what will take you to judgment. All that you would see tonight that Christ died in the place of sinners. And that you would see tonight that the words of Christ, not the detail about the tower. Friends, let's not get lost. Let's get get down to business. When Jesus said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. 
That's the necessity. I was only saying to Angus as I, before I stepped up, how lovely, how lovely it is to be with you this weekend. In fact, it's precious to me. It's sweet to be amongst you, to speak to new people, see faces we saw last year, faces that we met last year that now we're having fellowship with. Sweet to be here. But friends, I am duty bound. And before I leave this pulpit tonight, I'm all I'm calling you again to repent, believe upon Christ, because there is no other way. Cease from trying, cease from your religion, and look to Him who was sent, who came, and He lived. And he died. And on the third day, he rose again. And friends, I want to say something else. He's coming. And he's coming back. And one day there will be a greater gather than this. And this will be in the air. Turn from your sin, friends. Turn from your own way. Look to Christ. The promise is sure. That for those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what it says? They shall be saved. Not they might be. Not possibly. But they shall be saved. I urge you to do it this moment if you have not yet. But what for our churches? I'm sure there are a number of churches represented here tonight. Allow me for a moment to reflect again on that 9-11 documentary that I watched. At times to the uh, no delight to my wife, but I did watch it. You know, church, churches, pastors, members, deacons, elders, whatever you are. As I watched the events that took place, on that day, over 20 years ago, in the United States of America, these people decided, burn or jump. Tears filled my eyes. When I heard of the, the fireman recounting the events and, and how he was the only man from his staff who had survived that day and how he had been broken over it all his life, my, my very throat went dry. When I heard of the heartbreak of the mothers who had to tell their children that daddy wasn't coming home, I thought of my own. What a tragic day that was. What a great calamity that was. What about this though? As I watched this documentary, for days, I thought on it. And I asked this, how many of these 2,966 people were unrepentant sinners? How many of them went to their death to meet with outer darkness? And you're going to get all reformed on me, aren't you? And say, well, God is sovereign. And you know what? That's half your problem. You know, as terrible as these great calamities are, there is something far worse. And that is to meet with death without repentance. We hear it said so often. We hear it said by unbelievers in the main, sadly. He said he died peacefully. We, we walk around our local Anglican church and, and there's, there's, there's 10, 20, 30, 40. Maybe, no, no, no. There's hundreds. There's hundreds of them. And it says, R-I-P. Rest in peace. 
Friends, though, of course we grasp the notion of that. What we need to finally get to, and what we must see, that no one outside of Christ, no one outside of repentance dies peaceably. You know what? It would be better to die in a furnace of fire, being repentant and clinging to Christ, and it being an unrepentant man who dies quietly in his sleep. So, churches, what do we do? Well, says one, don't worry so much. The elect, they'll be saved. It's true, isn't it? The elect will be saved. Not, not, not one, friends. Not one of Christ will be lost. It's true, isn't it? I'm sure you've heard such response. You may be guilty of such response. And again, though, though we who are reformed believe such statements, we are assured that Christ will see the fruit of his travail, of his soul. We're sure of that. Oh, Christ, oh, friends, tonight, wherever your theolog theological uh, beliefs drop, whichever side of the fence they fall, know this. It is true. My friends, it is true that not one will be lost. He will gather in his elect from every corner of the earth. Oh, Christ did not die in vain. Christ's blood was not one drop wasted, friends. It shall do what it was meant to do. But I ask you this, and if you go home and remember anything that I've said, I pray with all my heart that you hear this. Does that mean we sit in our comfy churches and watch the days go by, for God will have his elect? If that is our thought, then maybe we have slipped into the hyper-Calvinism. At times I do worry that so many reformed churches have. Remember, saints, that God has ordained the preaching of his word to gather in his elect. He's given them that method. What a privilege it is. And what we, what you, what I must get busy doing is preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified and calling men and women to repentance. Does your church evangelize the community? Or our churches? Busy in evangelism. Friends, we must preach the gospel. Even Christ himself said this. I came to preach the gospel. Why? Those fine words that the great apostle Paul said. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Friends, it saves Saves, you've heard it tonight. It saves. It's the power of God. It saves sinners like you. It saved a sinner like me. It saved a busy, uh, a, a brother here called Billy McCurry. It saved Mr. Angus Cameron. It saves. This is a saving gospel. This is the only gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. 
got to get busy evangelizing. We've got to get busy telling people of Christ and Him crucified. You may be here tonight as I conclude. I'm not a preacher. Friends, I'm not asking you to be. But you can tell your family. You can tell your friends. You can tell the butcher. You can tell the baker and the candlestick maker. There's so many things that you can be doing. You can be praying. I believe this, and I must finish. But our prayer meetings are dry and cold because we have ceased to evangelize. We've got nothing to pray about. Or we're praying that God would save and there's, our evangelism has ceased. Friends, the two do not go hand in hand. We must be active. We must be proactive. We must be seeking to evangelize our communities. And we can pray. And you know what? You can give. And you can get behind your pastor and your houses. And you can serve. And you can hold the ropes, as Paul Washer says, while other goes. Friends, the last calamity on earth hasn't taken place yet. There will be sadly more tragedies. There will be great calamities. More loss. More loss of life. More wars. More crime. This will bring more grief and it will bring more loss. But saints, tonight, know this. That there is a greater calamity. And that is, as I've already alluded to, is to stand before a holy and a just God as an unrepentant sinner who has rejected the Christ who came and died. I finish where I started. It's a wonderful privilege for me to stand here tonight and be in this pulpit but I can't waste a second of it. So I once more plead with you to realize that we, that you, have the message of hope. We have, friends, the message of eternal life. Friends, you know what? The politicians don't have it. Maybe some of you tonight actually deep down think they do. Friends, you know what? They don't. They don't. And they weren't called to have it. You were called to have it. And you were called to proclaim it. Don't have it. We must cease from calling people to a better life. But rather be busy preaching the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Calling men and women everywhere to believe on him whom God has sent. For there is no one other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen.